National Fire Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to the National Fire Radio podcast where we are releasing daily episodes Monday through Friday. Conversations with people that are in love with this job. We talk about the highs and the lows and everything in between. But if you're here listening and part of the National Fire Radio community and you're checking out this podcast, whether it's your first episode or you're all the way in on a hundred and something episodes by now and you're bought into it, we appreciate you. We appreciate you being part of the community and constantly coming back and listening to the podcast. Welcome. Enjoy the word. And for us to be able to do this and deliver this to you every day, we need the help of some sponsors. And these sponsors are partners where we do collaboration work, and they allow us to put forth great content with great guests so that we can keep pushing this job forward. So before we hop into the episode, a quick word from some of our sponsors. Our first sponsor of the podcast, Taylor's Tins. Taylor and her screw have been manufacturing helmet fronts, aluminum helmet fronts, since 2017, over 200,000 plus shields have been manufactured by Taylor and his crew. Custom helmet fronts shipped within 24 to 48 hours. Whether it's one piece to a 500 piece department order, they'll get them out under two days. They're doing incredible work, 100% customizable product. Their product is top shelf. Not only are they doing aluminum helmet fronts, they're doing gas cards, playing cards, keychains, medical cards, and charts. Pump charts, street signs, custom signs, banquet awards, you name it, they're doing it. Go to taylorstins.com. And if you do order, use this promo code NFR sent me, all one word, NFR sent me, and you'll get 15% off at checkout. That's because we have a strong relationship and friendship with Taylor from Taylor's Tins. They've been a longtime supporter of the National Fire Radio platform, and I appreciate their support and friendship. Without further ado, the daily episode yeah go nuts all right hey everybody it's rob national fire radio very excited for the new episode tonight i'm here with the legendary russell vidler uh so my connection with russ um comes from most of my recruits who have gone to the montour falls fire academy have come back and they talk about this uh, uh pt guy and everybody's pretty tuned up about it like Nobody has a bad thing to say about them, which is pretty, pretty interesting because they don't certainly like think your workouts are weak or anything. But, uh, you know, so I, I got the opportunity um, through a mutual friend about some questions I had and I got to reach out to you. And we're here today as a result of that. So, Russ, thank you for coming on on the podcast. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. Thanks for reaching out. It's a it's a privilege. So, Russ, you are a firefighter in Ithaca, New York. So, up, upstate, true upstate, not true. like me in Hudson yeah. Valley. Uh huh. And you've been a firefighter for how many years? Uh, for eight. All right, eight years. Yeah. And you, uh, on top of being a firefighter, you also are a state fire instructor and you work uh, with the academy staff um, as well, correct? Yep. I pretty much just do um, PT at the academy. Um, but yeah, I've been doing that for like three or four years. Awesome. And then, and how did you get into the fire service? Like, what's your what's your background? Are you second generation, third generation, or are you just not at all? So I came out of the womb wearing army green. So um, I knew I was going to join the army um, as long as I can remember. So I went and did that after high school, um, and eventually retired from the army. But I got off active duty, um, and I really missed the brotherhood. Um, I missed the camaraderie and I was going to college and just wanted to skull drag frat boys left and right. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so I started taking civil service exams. Um, and when you leave the army, when you leave active duty, you talk to like this career counselor dude and he's like, you're an infantry dude. You should be a cop or a bodyguard. So I started taking a bunch of police exams and, uh, yeah, my best friend, Zach, was like, hey, Ithaca Fire is hiring. You should come take the test. The deadline's tomorrow. So I took one fire exam, and uh, then I didn't hear from him for years. A year passed, and two years passed. So I didn't think anything was ever going to come of it. So then I went and did the bodyguard thing. I went, to, um, I went and I was a bodyguard for the fifth richest dude in the world. In, uh, I went and guarded him in San Francisco. Um, 
and then I got a letter from the Ithaca Fire Department saying, um, come interview. So I flew back for the interview, flew back for the physical, and moved all the way back home with my wife and my one-year-old. Um, and yeah. When, for, for you, when did you know that like this was a good decision? Like, cause I mean, like you, you, you hit on something before and that was that, um, missing that brotherhood and that camaraderie from being in, in the army. Like, yeah. was there that, like, when did you have that moment that you were like, Hey, this is what, exactly what I was looking for. Um, well in the army, my last duty position was a drill sergeant and I love like the barracks feel. So being at the academy with just a bunch of stinky dudes just trying to get work done, um, just pumped me up because the suck, that's what bonds you more than anything. Um, so yeah, at the academy was when I like finally took a breath. I got my brotherhood back. I got my purpose back. And then when I went when I got out of the academy, graduated the academy and got to drive fire trucks, it was like, man, how did I not know about this? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I, it's that, incredible. I love it. And and like for Ithaca, like what's the makeup of the city of Ithaca? Because I know it's a, it, you know, it, it, it's I don't want to call it a rough town, but it's like it's a town that's got that got uh, definite work potential. Yeah, we um, we have a little bit of everything in Ithaca. Like roughly half the population is students, um, so when they're in town, um, you know they're gonna get silly, um, and we could do everything from like a rope job to a fire to several ODs all in a shift. Um, so yeah, it's I love it. I love the um, I love the pace of it. I love showing up not knowing what the heck I'm gonna get into that day. Um, and just knowing like most cops around here, they drive around by themselves, but I don't go anywhere without a brother or a sister. And that just, it, it pumps me up. Yeah. I love it. I, you know, and I know like, so I, I also work in a uh, fire district in, in a first two area that has a lot of college students. And I think the interesting thing about colleges is especially off campus housing, that size up and yeah. that uh, training mentality has to change because you're looking at a house that could literally be, you know, double stacked with people in each room. Like, yep. you know, the law may say something, but like there's all these loopholes. So you can mm -hmm. roll up to this house that is supposed to have a normal family layout, but yeah. it's divided. There's walls. Yeah, it's there's... Cut up like crazy. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. That's all. Awesome. So uh, eventually you got hooked into the SFI position. And I, well, first I want to just say like, what was it like in the Academy? Because, uh, if you were coming from being a drill instructor to getting into the academy mindset, there had to be a little part of you that chuckled when. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I will never forget um, during orientation um, a certain individual who will remain nameless, who we all know, um, said that the academy was paramilitary. So I was like, send it. Let's go. And then the whole rest of the time, I was completely over the top and destroyed everything. Um, and there was no PT program because they were sort of in between. Um, they had just lost a legend, uh, right. Chief Tom Margate. He was, um, I'm told, I never met the man, um, that he was all about the troops. And he would show up even like in the midst of his battle with cancer, would show up and, and PT Yes. the recruits and stuff. Um, so that was actually one of the first things I did was um, I made the Tom Margate um, All Heart Award, which goes to the the recruit that just goes all out every day, um, regardless um, of how tired they are or anything like that. Um, that's one of the things I'm most proud of. But leaving the academy, well, while I was at the academy, I sort of took it upon myself to PT our guys um and then we we just had like a group of just studs go-getters and you know every practice cpat we were going all out and it was a big competition and it i just it was it was great um but i've been in love with pt 
since I joined the military. I never really, I was always athletic. I was always playing sports and stuff, but I never really got, I was a stick. I weighed 146 pounds when I joined the military after high school. Um, and my first team leader was Mr. Tampa. So he was like jacked and he got me in the gym and I, uh, just became addicted to it. And then, um, went to Iraq for 15 months and realized like how therapeutic the gym was. Um, and then at the Academy, I realized that something was missing that I could, um, really, I feel like fill a void. Um, yeah. So I used all that as motivation. And after I graduated the Academy, after I was on the job for, I think a year or so, um, I went to school and got my master's in fitness and wellness leadership and then came back to the academy and told them that I'm their new PT guy. Awesome. Yeah. And from uh, what I understand, you know, I've, 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 I met uh, Chief Margaret one time, but like you could tell from his, how he held himself and his stature that like he didn't, uh, demand respect, but respect was commanded from his presence because he was no, no bullshit. That's exactly. Yeah. And that's what I'm told. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I truly think that, like I said, given some of the stories that you would be very pleased to see you in, in, in that place and that, like this PT program going oh, um, man, in that, direction. That's very humbling. I appreciate that. So you get your, your master's in fitness and leadership right? Yeah. Fitness and wellness leadership. Oh, fit, wellness leadership. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you come back to the Academy and really like, this is like, we talk about fitness in the fire service. We talk about like all the, all the stuff that we know or mm -hmm. energy deaths that happen, you know, around us just not being in shape, but like, what is it? Where, where do you think we're missing the ball when it comes to fitness and how we're delivering it? Because I'm just getting back into the routine here after like an uncomfortable amount of time off from working out. Yeah. And like, I'm, I'm probably more dedicated right now than I have ever been to getting in shape. Yeah. Um, but like, what, what are we doing right? And what are we doing wrong in this, in this battle? Cause I think it is a battle that we're, we're facing in the American fire service. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, th I mean, we all come here to like with the best of intentions and nobody intends to, you know, get old and broken and get out of shape and everything like this, but life happens. Um, I think there's some big things that, that we're missing. Um, that it's much more than just fitness. Fitness um, is like a portion. And that's what I, that's why I call it a, a wellness program. Um, I am the PT guy, but what we do is so much more than physical training. Um, it's all encompassing. It, it, I think that's what we need to embrace and that's what we need to teach. And um, we really need to prepare our young firefighters for a life of wellness. Cause you take any, any piece of the pie and you make it junk and that makes your quality of life go down. That makes your quality of work go down. Um, but yeah, with using little things, just keeping up with little, really little things, you can feel a lot better um, and have a lot have a rewarding career for a lot longer, I think. And then leave the career knowing that you did something good, but not like completely broken, you know, having something to give your grandkids and things like that. What does like a wellness program, what does that mean? Because it's like, I feel like it's been a buzzword in the fire service and they're like, Oh, fire department should develop a fitness and wellness program. But like, what does it yeah. actually mean? Because I, I think that's one of the disconnects is like, I don't even know what it means. Like, sure. so I think I look at wellness as like an all encompassing thing, which includes physical fitness. It includes uh, nutrition, hydration, um, behavioral health stuff, mental health, hygiene, sleep, hygiene, um, man, everything and everything. 
to think that like, like we know that cardiac issues are a thing for us. Um, but do we know how, how much being hydrated decreases our risk of having a cardiac event? It's, I mean, it, it's mind blowing that something as simple as just drinking water can seriously decrease um, the risk of having a cardiac event. And, you know, not a whole lot of people know about it. Or maybe they do and they choose, you know, not to do anything about it. And, and like I, that. What's that? Stuff like that. Yeah. And I think you, you hit something before, like, the, uh, you know, we said PT, hydration, mental health and mental wellness, and then like uh, sleep, you know, and, and being rested. Yeah. Cause like that is, I, I started listening to, uh, I think it was David Goggins the other day and he was, yeah, he was talking about, he said, there's there people out there who say, uh, I'll sleep when you're dead. When I'm dead. If you don't get sleep, that's how you're going to end up dead. Yep. And Straight I started up. looking into like the health effects of being sleep deprived because mm -hmm. for us, for, we're in that cycle where our alarms are hitting, you know, after midnight, it's like from 11 o'clock till three in the morning. Yep. So, um, like for us, like a lot of us are having a hard time, like oh, one, I don't bounce. I'm 41 now. I don't bounce back. Like I used to when I was younger. Straight up. So, yep. uh, I, I noticed that like, I have had to make changes in my life because my 24s recently have destroyed my three days off. And Dude, yeah, I, I've had to actively take, uh, like the, the steps to make sure that I, I'm coming home. I don't have activities planned because those activities are not going to happen. I need to, I need to be asleep yep. and, you know, and, and resting, not sleep the whole day away, but, but catch up on that. So like those, yep. those things, I can I, I kind of hit, hit on that because I think people are missing out on that too. Like that's a sleep is a big issue in the fire service and sleep is huge, man. And we, it's something that we take for granted. Um, but as much as, I mean, you can work all day, but if you don't recover those muscles, they're never going to build to what they would if you recovered them. Never, ever. And I mean, you got to treat your brain like a muscle too. Mm -hmm. You know, you can read all the books on the, in the world, but if you don't get good sleep, you're not going to retain as much as you would. And sleep deprivation, I mean, it, it affects everything. It affects your, your mood. Um, I know I get the wife can tell when I she doesn't even have to ask a question. She can tell when I had a rough night night shift or whatever just by my um, irritability and stuff like this, you know? Yeah. I know that the other day we were having a, a just a conversation about sleep deprivation because the guys had a rough night and, you know, there was this like conversation about like, hey, let them sleep. And the corporate answer came around of well like it's eight o'clock and he's supposed to be up and i'm like do we need to have him up though because if he didn't sleep the whole night and he's been up for 24 hours like what does that look like behind the wheel right yeah. like would we consider that driving impaired and i think the studies have told us yes we would so 100 yeah yep. why like like this isn't good for anybody he's here he's got to be here yeah i'm not saying don't let him not do his job but let's give him a a, you know, an extra yep. hour or two just to kind of grab what rest he can. Absolutely. I, I see it very regularly. Um, and it's unfortunately the firefighters are taking care of each other like they should. And, you know, the senior firefighters are, are scooping up the young guys and saying, go catch a nap because last night kicked our butts. And, you know, tonight has the potential of doing it again. Um, but whether it's, you know, the white hats or the front office or whoever there's um, seems to be some, some type of disconnect somewhere. Um, I've even seen it so much as they, they recognize that sleep deprivation is something that we deal with and that it's unhealthy. Um, but we're still like going to DPW in the middle of the night to pick up a truck because it's fixed but we could also do that at the start of the shift and the next morning, you know? Right. Like, yeah. I add to the madness. 100%. I think that's always been one of the things is like the common sense that should be there sometimes is missed out. Like I, 
I, I wish that um, in promotion to chief and like upper management positions, they could have to do at least like once a month, a 24 hour shift where they're up at night and then try to function the next day as a normal. Yeah. Normal it's good for being. Or something. I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. So Russ, like we, you know, not to like the, the fitness part of, of, of stuff here, like for mm-hmm. people who are out there and they're, they're having, they're on the fence. They want to get back into working out. Like, I think uh, I know for myself, one of the struggles was always like, Hey, I have to identify with a program or be on some kind of P90X or whatever the commercial program is, you know, mm-hmm. go to the gym with all the, what I would say, all the muscle heads who, um, intimidate the crap out of me. But like, what, what is, what are some of the ways that people can get into the functional fitness that's kind of centered around the fire service to make it? I mean, ultimately they got to get up and do it, but like, sure. I feel like there's some hacks that there that are out there. I mean, you can't hack hard work, but like, you know, you can, you don't have to start off trying to train for a marathon. You can just yep. simply start moving. Yeah, absolutely. I like that by the way, you can't hack hard work. I'm definitely going to steal that. Um, so I don't prescribe to any one method. I prescribe to the idea that whatever gets you moving is a beautiful thing and you need to keep doing that thing. If, if you weights aren't for everybody, mm-hmm. I, I recognize that. So I try to throw as much stuff at you, at you while you're at the Academy as I possibly can. We're even meditating. Like it's not, I'll, I'll do, I'll do anything in the name of, firefighter wellness, fitness and wellness. Um, so I don't even think like, yes, functional fitness has its place, I think across the board, um, because it, it gives us PT and it gets us better at the at our job simultaneously. Um, but I think there's stuff at home that we can be doing that we just enjoy. We might have to go find it, um, but it gets us moving, gets us feeling better and will get us feeling better to do the actual functional fitness, you know, in the firehouse or at home, wherever you're at. What's the, I don't want to say what's the, the goal when you're working out, but like, what are, cause that's the, I think like, so no, people have different ideas in there. Like I, for, a, for a long time, I was like, especially at the start of the pandemic, cause I was just so, I didn't know what the hell was going on with the rest of us. Yeah. But like me and another firefighter, we started walking, just doing a like laps around the firehouse because we didn't know what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing, what we knew that sitting around and being yep. afraid wasn't going to be the thing to do. So we started like, and we were putting my, like by, we would start at, you know, 7.30 after checking our stuff. And by nine o'clock, we would have walked like the 10,000 steps of it or be damn near close. Yeah. And people are like, yeah, but that's not working out. I'm like, yeah, but we're we're still moving. Like, and I've hit my step goal, so I don't know. I disagree completely. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's a low impact. You're working out. You're burning calories, unless you're doing it like eating a hot fudge sundae or something. <laughs> no guarantees on that one, but no. Yeah, understood. <laughs> yeah, firehouse ice cream is sacred. You actually, that's a great point. You talked about, hey, that's low impact. Like, you know. It, you're on shift. What kind of workout should you be doing? Because I'm, I was always worried about like working too hard mm-hmm. uh, and then having like, uh, having like uh, this, you know, fire of the century come in. And unfortunately it yeah. happened to me once where I did that, I was working, but it was awesome. Cause I had the heart rate tracker on the whole second alarm. So, um, cool. but so yeah, like, in my experience, I've always, I'm not really able to dial it down. I'm either working out, or I'm not. Okay. So, um, and I've never found that when an alarm comes in, um, whether it's a fire or an MVA or a rescue, whatever it might be, there's always something left in the tank. I mean, the good Lord made us with um, reserves for the most part, unless you're like, you know, have low blood sugar and you didn't eat that day or something like that, which I would, if you're that guy, I'd recommend carrying like trail mix and some granola bars in your go bag all the time anyway. But yeah, I'm not, 
I was concerned with that at first until mm -hmm. it happened. And then it comes from somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we are we are pretty complicated machines, but we don't uh, fail easily. Yes, exactly. Yep. So, you know, like so we were kind of hitting before, like a, it's it's an all encompassing thing. Like, what is your like if if somebody is on the fence about going into getting to work out again? Like, what are some of the simple things that they can start doing? Um, like resources, back pocket tricks. Like, what, what's your what's your? I don't want to say your go to because everybody's personalized, but like. What kind sure. of what kind of works? What kind of doesn't? Like, where, where maybe where are the pitfalls that people get themselves into, where they I, won't continue working out? Yeah, I would think the pitfall would be thinking that you have to go somewhere, or you have to have something, or be a member of something in order to get a workout in. Um, I love body weight workouts. I'm not lifting nearly as much weight as I used to. And that's just because my joints just started screaming at me. Um, and I realized that I can do the, the same, I can have the same result just using body weight then. Um, and I'm not destroying my joints. Um, and that's what I encourage a lot of people to start out with. Like we actually just had a couple new guys today and that's all we do starting out is just body weight stuff um and we correct form and things like that before we put a load on so yeah that's where i would start is body weight stuff there's a lot of fun things that you can do uh, i mean the internet's loaded with stuff um but yeah i love grass drills like you know high school football going outside rolling around in the dirt <laughs> and like mountain climbers and push-ups and I'm an army guy. I'm a grunt at heart. So anytime I get to do like, yeah, just grass drills, I don't need a whole lot, but we can do a workout. I promise you that. Right. And, and I, I've always like one of my friends uh, from the city because he fire department, he's uh, I mean, he's out of the service, but he's, I think they all still consider themselves Marines. Um, yeah. I have to hide my crayons from him, but For sure. he, yeah he always like what would always shocked me was he said he's like yeah like there were no weight rooms in in boot camp it wasn't nope. like we were going out and like you know putting plates on or anything like this is all like body like yeah. push-ups sit-ups like yeah. jumping jacks like calisthenics you know mm -hmm. mountain climbers like things like that so oh, it's really yeah. yep you you don't have to have the state-of-the-art facilities because it works for our nation's military we pretty much turn them guys out and absolutely you know, an yep. example of it so yeah. Um, and that's actually the model that I think is um, maybe not unique, but I think it's unique to my experience um, being a drill sergeant and running troops through basic um, every morning. It's like it's structured in a way so that it is we do the same warm up that the, the army does um, or did. They have a new PT program now, but. Um, and they return to the position of attention between exercises and they, it's all in cadence and we do cadence runs for morale and esprit de corps and everything like that. So it, it actually is now paramilitary, um, where before that might've been questionable. You know, I, I think cadence runs don't get the credit that they deserve. And I had, um, my sister-in-law got, uh, blood cancer a couple of years ago and i ended up running a half marathon to raise money for the uh, leukemia lymphoma society uh, my wife and i did it together <clears throat> and i said I, I ran cross country in high school but i was like how am i going to run a half marathon like this is 13 mm -hmm. miles yeah i hate running yeah and i remember the first mile or two, like you know the first couple weeks just struggling with mm -hmm. everything and then yeah. I found on, on Spotify, there was this like uh, hardcore. Yeah, you know, dude. Uh, you know, it was um, the cadences of the United States or the U.S. Army Rangers or Airborne Rangers. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, like, let me listen to this. Like, maybe this cadence thing will help me out. And I couldn't yeah. believe that, like, from like, as far as the timing went, like, it got my pace to be right where I wanted it to be. Yep. And also 
learned how to control my breathing during the workout. Absolutely. I the cadences to myself. I mean, everybody yeah. around me was like, this, who the heck, like, this crazy psychopath is running down the rail oh. trail uh-huh. talking about calling Willie Peaton on a cobra <laughs> trail. But like, that's awesome. Yeah, dude. Um, that's like my favorite thing. That is my jam, calling cadence. Um, and every recruit that comes through will tell you, um, I love it. We, I love going on cadence runs. They're, they, they're designed for everyone to finish together. So the studs aren't going to get that much of a workout than the guys that are coming in less in shape. Um, but that's not really the point of a, a cadence run. The, a cadence run is to improve morale. It's to start something together and finish it together. Um, and it's just, man, there's no greater feeling than being with your family in the suck and singing about it. I mean, that's yeah. a beautiful thing. I, I also think that from a functionality standpoint, when it comes to the job, like I noticed immediately within a couple weeks of doing cadence runs on my own, that I was getting better at communicating on the radio under stress at work because that whole time, like, because you can't eventually your body is either going to collapse. You're going to figure out how to breathe and talk at the same time. Yep. So like, I, I always thought that was a very, like nobody talks about the cadences and how they actually help people kind of you know be able to do their job and 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 it might not be like no one's gonna sit there and be like well you're not going to stretch a line on a cadence yeah but you're going to communicate while you're stretching the line absolutely yeah i mean i never thought of it like that but that is 100 percent true yeah absolutely that's great and, and when i think about that you're running and then like you're calling a cadence you're listening to it and then you're getting that breath in and you're breathing through as you're talking or, or singing out. Yeah. And that's like the exact same thing that we need to, while you're doing a, like you said, it's not, it's not for the studs. It's not going to be a race for time, Sure, but it's certainly going to be under, under some kind of physical strain. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And I like to do like, um, last firefighter ups in the middle of them too. Um, so yeah, we mix it up. But yeah, cadence calls, that's that's my jam. If you could make it up to a graduation, um, we sing cadence like marching men and leaving and everything. It's a good time. Now, um, one of the original reasons why I reached out to you was because there was a little interesting dynamic that was happening on Facebook from somebody posting, or not Facebook, on Instagram from a friend of mine posting some cancer prevention um information because we have we, we it's no secret now we know that our turnout gear is uh essentially off gassing cancer onto us and pfafs yeah. and i started talking to you about some of the things that we could do because like you know there's po i always screw this up i want to say potpt but i that's not top yes yeah pt yep physical training. And then there's the breathe down drills when we're doing like the, like an actual, like essentially a litmus test for us to see how long the, the, the bottles working as we're going through. So we can understand our own competency of working sure. time on, on, on a cylinder, especially when we're new. Yeah. Um, with that being said, one of the things that I've changed up in this workout routine that I'm getting into is I got a sweatsuit. Uh, like I've got sweatpants and a hoodie and mm-hmm. I'm starting to use a ruck pack with it as well uh, on my elliptical for low impact. But um, like, the, like, like kind of like for those who are out there that want to get functional fitness down, but like don't maybe don't want to expose themselves to to the, you know, PFAS that are starting to come out of our turnout gear until we can get that figured out. Mm-hmm. Like kind of talk us through like what what we need to, to do that. Yeah, I mean, turnout gear is it would be great if we could use it if we could train exactly how we fight but it's not good for us so we got to do like we what we've done since our inception and adapt and improvise and overcome so throw the sweatsuit on throw a weight vest on throw um i mean fire boots on or heavier boots on ankle weights anything and everything to simulate the weight 
and just the um, cumbersomeness, if that's a word, um, of turnout gear. Just got to get creative, you know. I wouldn't let um, not being able to work out and turn out gear stop you from de- being doing TOPT because I think TOPT is way too valuable um, to stop that. But we should certainly think about other ways of of doing it for sure. What what's the value? I mean, because like you you perked up on that, like you, there's a there's some passion in your voice on on the importance of TOPT. Yeah, so TOPT it's it's what structured physical fitness is all about. It's doing what we're doing day to day on the job um, for physical fitness. It's it's a you're getting a workout while getting um, getting experience swinging a sledgehammer um, the way you would do it, you know, on the scene of a fire, taking a door or whatever. Um, you're simulating pulling ceilings. Um, I mean, literally anything that you can think of that you would do on the job, any movement that you could think of, um, doing it for PT is really all it is. Carrying around a couple saws, just doing laps around the, um, apparatus bay with some saws doing farmer carries. That is TOPT. Um, yeah, it's, you just got to get creative. That's why when you say like, what can you do? There's literally endless things that we can do. We just got to figure out like what motivates us, figure out what motivates you, whether it's your family or you want to be good at your job or, you know, you don't want to let down your community or you want to earn your paycheck or this or that, whatever, whatever it is that motivates you and just go do if, as long as you go do, you're going to be right. I promise. I had to write that down. That's good. As long as you go do, you're going to be right. You're going to be right. You're going to do right. Yes. Okay. We'll play it back on the. <laughs> yes. But that's awesome, man. That's, that's, that's great. Thank you. Russ, what's uh like outside of the Ithaca fire department and the state fire Academy, do you have any other ventures that you do? Um, I think I've got like 13 jobs right now, but the, the one I enjoy most, the thing I'm most passionate about is being a husband and a father. I've got five little kids. I've been with my wife since high school. We've been together um, or we've known each other since middle school. Um, and she's my absolute rock. She's my angel sent directly from the Lord himself. <laughs> um, What's your wife's name? Her name's Lindsay. She's, Lindsay? Okay. A stud. she's an absolute stud. She had all five of our kids at home in the bathtub. She hasn't taken a Tylenol since our 10 year old, since before she got pregnant with our 10 year old. She's like <laughs> superwoman. It's yeah, it's pretty insane. You know, I, I, I think that's, I like that you said that you want to, you know, you're, you have five kids and you want to be a, an awesome husband to your wife. Uh, like that's, that's hard. Like being in a relationship is 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 difficult. It is not all sunshine and rainbows. Are the hardest thing I think to uh, work around in life, especially in the fire service, because yep, just the the nature of our work. So like, yeah. you know, it is. Uh, I don't want to because I mean, like, relationship advice is weird. But like, what's what's one of the things that you find that helps you be a better husband? Um. So oddly enough, when I got first got on the job, um, I learned about EAP and I was like, they give us all this stuff for free. Why doesn't anybody use it? So Lindsay and I used EAP as like a date night and we started going to this marriage counselor. And I, I know now that people use EAP because like generally they have an issue. They don't just do it for the fun like we were doing Um, but I'm kind of a wild man. So anyways, um, this lady literally was like a translator for us. It was incredible. Uh, one of the biggest things I've learned is that just men and women are different beings and we communicate differently. And I remember being in this lady's office and I would 
say something and she would, the, the therapist would translate it to lady speak. And Lindsay would be like, oh, well, why, why didn't you say that before? And I'm like, I've been saying that for years. What do you mean? Um, and then it turned out that the lady was a sex therapist. We found this out like after the fact. Um, and I think that paid dividends. Anyways, um, <laughs> communication is is huge. Um, and I think it's okay to let, I don't think, it's okay to let, it's okay to have expectations for the people that we love and for the people that love us. And if we don't let them know what our expectations are, then they're unknowingly meeting, uh, not meeting those expectations. And we end up, you know, uh, disconnecting because of it. Um, so yeah. Um, and grace, you gotta have grace for each other. Everybody's just a human being trying to do their best. Um, you know, take a step back, take a breath. I know when I come home, <laughs> it, Lindsay's w working harder than I am most days, chasing down five kids. Um, so, yeah, I just, you know, just try to give her room to live. Yeah, but I, I didn't, I didn't expect us to go down this road, but like, I'm, I'm happy we did because I think that's like, I'm watching as I get older people and myself, you know, having going to counseling, especially, you know, doing stuff with my wife together and, and, and learning about that uh, communication is, is huge. And I'm watching mm -hmm. it happen to my friends and, the, and it's like, and, and I just think that we need to, like, cause like we need to do a better job maybe as a fire service, you know, just for our own kind of being like, Hey, here's, here, here's something like, you know, I don't know. It's like that's another senior man role that's just not getting filled out anymore. Yeah, yep. uh, senior man's been divorced eight times and is bitter as hell. Right. right. You know. Yeah. <laughs> it's married to the job. Yeah, exactly. On yeah. this note, if I could keep going um, for a yeah. minute um, on the talking part. So, talking is more powerful than I think we understand. Not just as a fire service, but as like a people. So our latest plague is in the fire service is PTSD and suicides are killing us. Um, I mean, second only to cardiac stuff, but it could actually have, it, it has surpassed cardiac stuff in some years. And they say suicides are very much, um, what is it? Under registered or whatever. Underreported. Underreported. Thank yeah. You. yeah. Um, and from my time in Iraq, um, I have experience with PTSD and my wife was going to school for social work the whole time I was gone, which is, I think is absolutely hilarious. Um, but so having PTSD is, it's as simple as just going through something that's jacked up, right? Like we're, ordinary people called to extraordinary circumstances and we're seeing jacked up stuff. You know, maybe it's just one thing that bothers you. Maybe it doesn't even bother you, but you don't process it. That's all it is, is you don't process it. So you stuff it down and where you stuff it down, who knows, but where it comes back out is where we're most comfortable. It comes back out at, in our homes and we end up, bleeding all over people that we never that never cut us in the first place we end up hurting our our wives and our kids maybe not physically but emotionally and mentally and we're ending up killing ourselves and ptsd can be cured some say it it's never cured but it can it can you can start to heal by simply talking all you got to do is talk, talk about this awful thing and allow yourself to process it. Cry because it was jacked up. Why wouldn't you cry? Yeah. And process the darn thing. And then what do you know? It doesn't start coming up in places you, you don't want it to because you processed it.
I mean, it's this is something that for as many people are killing themselves, this conversation right now isn't happening nearly enough. And I mean, the IAFF opened up uh, a behavioral health clinic down in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, Mm -hmm. which I was, um, I guess, blessed enough to stay at. I went down to the center of excellence um, and they're going to open up a, they want to open up a West coast facility but that place is like booked pretty much constantly. And they like, we don't, we don't talk about it. I don't, I don't really understand it. Yeah. I, I, I know. So I'm, you know, aside from the firehouse and national fire radio, I'm a firearms instructor. Mm-hmm. And I tell each one of my students about like, we get to the point where we're like, Hey, like don't use firearms in an emotional state, such as anger, depression. Sure and I, I say like, I go right into like telling my students that I'm a suicide survivor. And mm-hmm. like, I go down that road with them because one, like everybody leaves my class with my phone number. Um, and like, I don't want you thinking of, you know, hurting yourself or hurting somebody else. And if you are like, you, like I tell everybody, you, you call me and we have, like I have, I have worked very hard to, to very diligently to get good health, mental health professionals in the Hudson Valley area. Yeah. Um, and Jeff Dill from firefighter behavioral health Alliance has helped in that, um, in that quest. But like, it is about talking. Cause I think people always say yeah. like, Oh man, like I wish we would have, you know, and yeah, some are going to take us by complete surprise, but like be invested mm-hmm. in your people because it's important to talk and like trust, trust our own intuition. You know, like yep. we know when things don't feel right on the fire ground. We know when things don't feel right on a EMS call yep. uh, and even in our own personal lives, like we'll come across somebody. And I always say in class, like you talk about intuition, you ever see mm-hmm. somebody that's like got glasses wearing a fire department hoodie that just, you know, doesn't look right and i'm like describing myself right now and you get that mm-hmm. and like oh this guy's creepy like that's your intuition that's your survival instincts but those instincts not only work for our own self-preservation but the, for the preservation of our brothers and sisters and if somebody is doing like if you have a bad feeling like one call them out and then like just the other point that i make about this is um this is an awkward turtle conversation because there's no training for it uh-huh. but have the conversation like a friend of mine posted something that he wrote when he first got hired and i didn't know any of the context from it but i got a hold of him immediately after reading it and i said listen man i don't i don't know how to say this any other way but like are you okay because like i just read that thing that you had on snapchat and yeah man i'm concerned it looks like a suicide note and i I don't want you hurting yourself like do you need me to come get you like what's and he was he was like, holy crap. No, that was a joke when I got hired by the city because uh, of all the stuff we were going through. Oh, gotcha. And I was like, all right, cool, man. Just but forget about it. You're but- absolutely right. There's countless stories of people just asking how you're doing that saved somebody from going home and, you know, attempting suicide. Yeah. And we, and I think the thing that we, like uh, Dr. Peter uh, Salerno, I, he had a book on, um, fit for off duty uh, for firefighters and mental health. It was really good. We interviewed him. um, I think it was a week or two ago. And, you know, if we can just, and I think what like Russ, you can kind of agree with this going down the path that you've walked. Like we need to get the radio station changed just in a minute. Like it's as simple as changing the music up. If we can get us off that thought process and, and us intervening in somebody to say like, Hey, are you okay? Or what's going on? Or talk to me or, you know what? I don't feel right. And like, I don't, I don't know what it is, but like, Mm -hmm. like, you know, it's, it's it's huge. So. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And we just have, we have too much. We know too much now. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's negligent at this point. It is absolutely negligent. Yeah. All the information that we have to, you know, sit back and not do anything. Well, Russ, we've been going for over 45 minutes. Um, I just want to, like, and like I said, these are a couple areas where I didn't, uh, this is the fun thing. I didn't expect we'd, we'd go into these areas, and I'm happy we did because. Uh, I'm an overshare. I am told that quite often, by the way. Me too. And sometimes I have this uh, 
uh, establishment that I have a reservation at the table. It's called the Too Far Cafe, but <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So, um, but Russ, where can people find you if they wanted to reach out and get a hold of you? you um, the Instagram, the Facebook. Uh, yeah, TikTok. Facebook. I'm on Facebook. I'll I'll make an Instagram after this, um, so I'll let you know what my Instagram name thingy is. Um, but yeah, Facebook, I guess would be the place to get me. Awesome. Well, Russ, thank you for taking the time to come on national fire radio, talk about fitness and everything. I got a ton of notes here, so that's good. So I always like when I get good notes from, uh, from the guest, but cool. thank you for being here and taking the time out of your night to, uh, chat with us. This is Rob national fire radio talking with Russ Vidler from Ithaca on all things fitness. And then even some, uh, family advice to be a better husband or a life partner and some PTSD stuff. So this has been good. It's Rob. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Thanks, man.